Hello there. I'm very happy to be here. I'm glad to see so many people already coming in. I hope you're enjoying ADC as much as I am. Uh, we're going to be talking about how to create remote user interfaces which run separately from the audio processes they control. That's what we mean by detaching the UI. And the point is controlling headless audio software. That's what we call this. I'm Elias Bergström. I'm a senior software engineer at Elk. I've always worked with audiovisual technologies, mainly now writing C++ user space code. Also have a decade in research, uh, PhD in audiovisual media technology, that sort of thing. With me is my colleague Gustav Andersson. I'll let him introduce himself. Yeah, thanks Elias. I'm Gustav Andersson. I'm also a senior software dev with um, Elk Audio. Yep. So yeah, I'm not hungover, I've slept well, I'm not jet lagged, so if this goes to hell, it's my fault. <laughs> so for those who don't know us, what does Elk Audio do? Mainly we've created an embedded Linux operating system specifically for audio, which runs on off-the-shelf systems on chips, supporting ARM and Intel x86 architecture. And the main advantage of Elk is you can achieve one millisecond of round trip audio latency while still maintaining market leading super high CPU efficiency without sacrificing all the benefits of working on a standard Linux operating system. So uh, many well-known companies are soon releasing products. Something happened the last two, three years and they decided to postpone, I don't know why. <laughs> you might know. Uh, with that said, they're coming soon. And uh, there is one wonderful product out there uh, that uses Elk Audio S quite extensively. It's Melbourne Audio's Nina synthesizer. It's very impressive. Uh, it also happens to be named after my daughter. I'm sure that's a co coincidence. Uh, if you don't know it, definitely look it up. It has motorized knobs. It's a very interesting instrument. Another product we have is the Elk Live Bridge, which uses Elk Audio S. So what is it? Using one of these for each person, each musician, uh, they can play together live over the internet with very low latency. And what makes that possible is the Elk Audio S, which at each node doesn't add any extra latency that you would normally get from a computer and audio interface. Instead, you just get whatever latency physics demands over the internet. Meaning we've had musicians playing together over the internet that would never have been able to otherwise. And it's working very, very well. So what is it that we provide with Elk Audio S? Uh, very briefly, in blue you see the software that we provide running a user space. In red is what we've written that interfaces with the hardware. And what users of Elk Audio S need to implement is what's highlighted in green, using mainly what you're already familiar with, VST plugins, nothing strange, no languages you've never used before. Most of the time, you can just cross-compile your plugin and it will work with no modification. Uh, what is in purple, you will see uh, here is third-party tools that are also part of the solution. We didn't make them, we just use them. Uh, not much more on our offering in this talk. If this sounds interesting to you, definitely go to elk.audio. There's much more information, examples, etc. It's dual license worth mentioning. So you can make Afro open source products. So, an overview of our talk. Why not just leave the UI where it is? Thank you very much. End of talk. We'll go home. Well, in some contexts, it's not so simple. You just don't have a choice. Uh, so, as audio developers, we're used to the editor interface, the user interface, and the audio processing being very tightly integrated something that is standard in uh, plugin development frameworks, et cetera. 
but uh, headless software is increasingly common. And there, a tightly integrated UI just is impossible. You have to find a way of controlling your plugin without an attached UI. And meanwhile, I guess you're all familiar with plugin APIs and the fact that they, at least the lowest common denominator, provides insufficient control for the full spectrum of parameters that you would want to control in your audio software plugins. So, quick overview of our talk. We're going to talk about the context for headless audio, some basic patterns for distributed systems that we've identified are useful for this work and this talk, challenges and solutions to implementing these, available tools, our concrete choices, and we're going to wrap up with a demonstration of what we've made, how it's used, and how you can use it. So let's look at what application areas where we found detaching the UI is relevant. For embedded musical instruments, devices often have very limited controls. And then those devices provide remote user interfaces which augment the controls and give you control over the full model of the device. And that way, for example, the Eventide H9 is a super compact pedal, fits in your hand luggage, doesn't take up space in the pedal board. You have the basic controls that you need, but if you want to get in there and really edit and change things, you have the iPad interface, you have the iPhone interface. Very good example of what we're talking about. With that said, some instruments have a wonderful UI, hands-on control. There's still use cases for having a detached UI. Uh, take a look at the Axis Virus TI, big fan. All the controls are there, but you would still get a lot of use from having a VST plugin which can control all the parameters of the virus, which you can save with your session. You know, a lot of advantages to that. Another context, uh, end user development, uh, kind of academic term. What that means is that end users of the tools that you make, customizing, adapting, combining tools so that they fit the context of use. Uh, I would say, this must have started with just plain old analog audio, like Daphne Oram, uh, Delia Derbyshire. They took audio tools and used them in a way where I'm sure the people made them never imagined they'd be used, and they got wonderful results out of that. So fast forward to today, we have MIDI, we have people adapting tools for live audiovisual performances, there's so much to it. I'll just show you a few examples. Uh, Dead Mouse stages really complex shows with robotics, projections, audio reactive stuff, all of it interacting with his music live, audience interaction, he's going crazy with this stuff, and all of it is what you would call end user development. I mean, he himself sits down and is learning Unreal Engine, connecting it to Ableton. I don't know who does the old robot arm programming, but it's impressive. Uh, another example, Skrillex, he wears a, an, I forget, Xsense motion capture suit, and he has a giant robot behind him on stage while performing, which can interact with the audio reactive visuals while he's dancing around. And an example which I love, I found this picture, and I, and I figured it's very, very telling. So you have this Pro Tools user, right? Expert audio engineer. He's bought three of these devices. They're not cheap, wonderful specialized tools. He's put three iPad Pros on top, <laughs> running the software that Pro Tools provides for controlling Pro Tools. And still, this person said, mm, I think I want a Stream Deck <laughs> on the side with a few extra buttons so that I can control some more features over sound flow and connecting the things that all of these wonderful tools already provided and well, were very well thought out. These tools don't have those things. And a few rolly blocks, because there's some other things he needs to do. That's end user development. Final context I've identified is the control of audio processing at a remote location. So uh, 
in that context, if the tools you use have a user interface or not is irrelevant because they're over there, wherever there is. Uh, and you need to find a way of providing control for them over the internet. So a good example, uh, analog audio, they provide a service where super high-end analog outboard gear is connected up with robotic controls so that you can actually turn a knob over the internet and hear the result with the audio that you stream to them coming back to you real time and being affected by your gestures on those controls. And they have a web interface. So then, I complained about plugin API parameter limitations. What do I mean by that? Why don't we just use those plugin APIs and the talk will go home? Well, surely nothing new to you. The lowest common denominator of those APIs is still today the single normalized float value. Sure, there is a lot of plugin APIs which support much more than that, but there's also many plugins and APIs and hosts that support only that. It's the lowest common denominator, and we all today still have to make sure that we keep to that to the greatest extent possible, or we are incompatible with some host, with some controller, etc. Uh, and yeah, there's workarounds around this limitation, but they're all compromises, I'm sure we agree. We're going to look at them later. Here, we use the term parameters, which comes from uh, the VST uh, plugin API, to describe these single normalized floats. And just to distinguish it from the full spectrum of possible control value types, we call the full spectrum properties. So what are the workarounds? Usually, what you do is, OK, I can't do it through the pl plugin API, but I have a GUI. I can use that GUI talking directly to my audio processor. And through that, I can pass all these values that I couldn't pass normally, whatever they are. You know, a selection in a list, a text string, a path, you name it. Uh, there's only one exception, and that's binary blob presets. That's supported, apart from the single normalized float. But again, when headless, there is no GUI. You can't really do this, can you? So moving on to distributed systems. I think pretty much all digital modern musical instruments uh, are, can be seen as, as digital computing systems. Uh, what distributed, sorry, digital, of course they're digital, distributed computing systems. So what is a distributed system? It's a, it's a collection of different network computers which communicate between them using some sort of message passing. And what patterns are, are, uh, are applicable to this context? That's a very big topic, I'm not summarizing it here. I'm going to go through just the basic three ones. But first, I'm going to talk about what all this messaging happens on, which is the transport layer. And because all this messaging depends on the transport layer, probably you've heard this before, but it's important to cover still. The main two choices are UDP and TCP each with its own advantages and disadvantages. UDP is connectionless. Messages are broadcasted. Receipt is not guaranteed. You do not expect any confirmation that the message was received. You don't expect any reply. Nor is the order of the messages guaranteed. Why do we even use it, you ask? Well, we'll get to that. TCP, on the other hand, is connection-oriented. You can't broadcast. It's just between two pairs. It ensures the order of receipt and reliability, but to achieve those, it could potentially incur much, horror, much higher latency and jitter compared to UDP. So depending on the use case, you still need to decide, should I use UDP, which guarantees low latency, but it has the drawbacks we mentioned, or can we use TCP with its advantages? And you always have to keep this in mind, whatever you implement. So first pattern, just the basic, message passing. You send a message. The choice here is to use the advantages of connectionless messaging, UDP, with the disadvantages we just talked about. And it's for direct messaging. Think of just a standard MIDI message. You send a note on, you send a note off, you send another note on, on and on and on. 
That's what it, this is. It's just message passing. Moving on to request response. We have a client. It requests. The server replies. It's like a function invocation with confirmation of receipt with a return value. It can be synchronous or asynchronous. Think of a standard web 1.0 server. And finally, publish, subscribe. So you have clients. They subscribe to notifications from servers. Servers notify on each change. And notifications stop when the server is offline or when the client unsubscribes, which is a bit like you know, web 2.0 push notifications. So moving on more concretely, what protocols and libraries can we use to implement these messaging patterns? There's many. For message passing, MIDI, OSC, raw UDP, for RPC, remote procedure call this GRPC, JSON RPC, Thrift, many, many more. We'll present what we use, MIDI, OSC, and GRPC. So I had to look it up. MIDI is an acronym. It stands for Marine Invertebrate Diversity Initiative. <laughs> <laughs> of course, we at ELK all support MIDI. It's a wonderful, wonderful initiative. There's not too much to say about it apart from you know, the familiar limitations, mainly that the namespace, parameter space, profile, whatever you want to call it, is fixed. No must to choose. It is a 1980s keyboard instrument. And if you want to support a wonderful Roland digital accordion or what I like to play, the V drums, you really, really have to hack MIDI 1.0 to get it to work. There will be compromises. And another issue for end user development is that messages are not human readable. So if you look at, even if you pass it, CC123 doesn't really convey what it's for. Uh, unless you've memorized what the default profile says it's for, which you might not have. And also, OK, there's general MIDI. But uh, as often as these are adhered to in, in, in actual implementations in the wild, just as often they aren't. Which brings us to the Open Sound Control Protocol, or OSC, which is now, I had to look it up, it's 25 years old. I'm always thinking, oh, OSC, it's this new thing. No? <laughs> it's been around. Uh, it was originally made for music performance data to share such data between instruments and computers. It's in quite widespread use today. I'm curious to see how many of you have used OSC. Oh, wonderful. Happy to see that. I still talk about it. Uh, so it was made by Frieden Wright at Scene Matt, 97. And it was originally made to expand and augment MIDI for musical performance data. So uh, that they can, you know, develop advanced instruments using all kinds of complex data. Now today, the, the use doesn't have to be musical. It's in very widespread use in many other contexts often media related. So in audiovisual performance, it's, it's, uh, it's super central. Uh, the official spec defines just socket messaging over UDP. You can use it over TCP. Nobody does that I know of. And it's common for request response and publish subscribe. But then you have to build on top of the official spec. The official spec doesn't really define these patterns. And there's add-ons. Uh, one is OSC query. It's widely supported, control applications, DAWs, plugins, and probably mostly by visuals, stage lighting, and projection mapping software, which is an industry very adjacent to what we're into. I'm sure they have their own conferences, though. So for those of you that haven't seen Ask Messages, these are Ask Messages. You can probably understand what they do without me talking about them, but I'm going to talk about them anyway. The first bit is the address pattern. Looks like a file path. The second bit is the type tag string. It tells you what the payload will be. Single float, single float, four floats, string and int. And then the actual payload promised. Meaning that just like a file path uh, relates to a, a directory structure, OSC messages relate to what I like to call a namespace, address space, Profile in MIDI 2.0 lingo. I'm repeating myself. Here you see all the nodes. You see all the 
kinds of messages you can send, the type tags, not much more to say about it. Simple and efficient. Just two words on OSC query. It adds rich discovery features for OSC, and in its core, it's a simple HTTP server which gives you discovery of the existence of servers on the network and discovery of their namespace and state. Uh, loads of optional functionality that we don't need to go into here. There is a library available, libosia, CPP, or LGPL. This is supported in quite a lot of visual software. I haven't seen much audio software supporting it. Maybe one day that will change, I hope. So, RPC protocols. For native request response and publish subscribe, you need a remote procedure call protocol, which allows you to invoke methods that are remote as if they were invoked locally. So, how many of you have seen or used gRPC? Used. Still quite a few. Okay. Uh, good to see. It requires a statically defined API using the protocol buffer interface description language, plain text dot protobuf file, in which you describe the methods and data structures of your API. Then that text file is, with tools provided by Google, transcompiled for each language that you want to use it for. So if you have a server that is implemented in C++, it includes the transcompiled header file from your protobuf API, and then you can write clients in JavaScript, Python, whatever you name it, which also use their respective transcompilations of the protobuf file, and they can talk to each other as if through magic with Google kindly solving all the problems in the library of gRPC. Very simple protocol buffer file. Say that you want to set a parameter, and to make it more interesting, you get a reply back with a text representation of the same parameter. Say it's, you're setting a volume and you want to get the same value back uh, in decibels. You know. First, you define the plugin with the method. And then the message is a set request that sets a float value. And the response is a string value. Not much more to it. Pretty simple. Always like simple things. In use, you include the H file. This is a server. So when the server receives the request, uh, if it overrides the set parameter method that it gets from the H file, it will create a reply, populate it with a string representation of the value just received, and say that it handled the thing OK. Meanwhile, a client includes the same H file has its own method signature. When you invoke the method from your program with a float value, it sends a request, gets the response. This is not the asynchronous example. And if the status is OK, it returns the response. If the status is not OK, it handles the error really, really badly in this example. I'm sure you can imagine how handling it correctly would look like a bit more than this slide. So just a little examples and, and talk about uh, related work where my colleague Gustav will take over. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elias. Um, yes, I'm Gustav Andersson, and I will continue with some of the related work in the field. Uh, you might think that hasn't this been done already? Um, but to some extent it has, but it seems like it's not fully. Um, Elias talked about the limitations of uh, the original MIDI, MIDI 1.0. Thankfully, we now have MIDI 2.0, uh, which looks really, really good. It has a lot of nice things like device profiles and discovery that uh, could be really good for controlling audio plugins remotely. Um, unfortunately, MIDI 2.0 adoption is very small at the moment. Uh, we hope that sometime in the future, this could be a good candidate for the go-to protocol for remote-controlled audio. Um, there has been a couple of ADC talks in the past uh, where people have used to run audio in a web browser. There's one by Jari Klemola from 2018, I think, where he has a custom use module.
to compile a Juice plugin, so it just runs in the web browser. There's also Magnus Bayer's talk from 2019 on compiling recent Rack extension plugins so that they also run in the browser and without changing any of the code. Um, this is all really cool, um, but what they do, it still runs in the, in the browser. It doesn't really separate the UI from the audio processing. So it only solves sort of half of the problem. Um, in the VST3 in interface, it's actually a quite interesting uh, suggestion that you should implement the audio processor class and the edit controller class, which is the class that then spawns the UI, as two separate classes, and you should not communicate between them. You should let the host do all the parameter updates, and there's even a, uh, a binary communication channel where you can send arbitrary data between them. Um, so that is suggested, uh, but to my knowledge, 99% of all VS3 plugins, including all Juice plugins, don't implement it this way. They implement both interfaces in the same class. And I don't know of any host that actually uses it to load the audio processor and the UI in different processor or even different devices. Um, but I thought it was quite interesting. I mean, I know the VS3 SDK gets a lot of complaints for being over-engineered, but I think in this case it was quite um, ahead of its time and forward-looking. Uh, there's also a couple of vendor-specific protocols, um, like the NKS, so Yukon and Mackie Control, that address some aspects of it, uh, like mainly mapping the parameter space of a plugin to a physical controller or a touch controller. I think, um, but it's not a complete API for controlling a plugin remotely. Um, but speaking of that, um, what functionality do you actually want for controlling, a, say, a plugin remotely? Um, the obvious one is you want to set the state of the audio processor, meaning the, the values of all parameters or properties. It could be the full state, it could be partial state with values of just some parameters. Um, you want to know if the device is there. Uh, in the case you have a third-party uh, processor, you want to be able to see the full namespace of it, meaning all the properties, uh, what types they have, if they're input or output or input only or something. You also, an analogous to that, you want to fetch the, the current state. Um, and you also want to be able to detect changes to the state. And ideally, you want to do this in a way where you don't have to keep polling the, the audio processor, but you want sort of the audio processor to, to tell you or tell the UI that something has changed, and ideally in some sort of push notification style. And if you're controlling, say, a DAW or a more complex sampler, you also want to do this in a way that, as Elias spoke earlier about the limitations of plugin APIs, you want to have a rich or complex model uh, and send complex data structures, something that's very hard to express with just a list of single value floats. Uh, like adding, adding, removing plugins, uh, reordering effects and, and loading samples, things like that. Uh, and you also want to enable end user development. That's uh, also an important point. Uh, you want to be able to do this in a way that you don't have to stop and start the audio. You don't want to recompile or redo anything. You want to do it live in the moment and not, not interrupting the creative flows. Um, so what are the implementation challenges? You've decided, yes, I want to do remote control of an audio processor, an audio plugin. Um, so what, what <laughs> problems will you run into? Uh, but the obvious one that you will always run into, and we always do as audio developers, is this concurrency and real-time safety. Uh, if you're doing network traffic, you can absolutely not do it in the audio thread or in any way that will halt or interrupt the audio thread anyway. And you shouldn't even do it in a, in a GUI thread. You should do it in its own thread, and you should have uh, real-time communication between that thread and other threads. Uh, but this is, this is probably old news to most of you. Um, there, are, there, there are tried and tested ways of doing this. Uh, if you're unsure, there's a great talk from 2019 uh, real-time one-on-one that goes through the, the problem in detail and gives you a lot of the common solutions like using lock-free queues and real-time safe data structures. Um, another challenge can be real reliability, um, and this is something that will influence your choice of um, 
network protocol or transport layer protocol. Um, if you're on a LAN or a cable LAN, you can kind of assume that you don't have packet drops because it's a very reliable channel. Uh, but if you're on Wi-Fi, however, you can not assume you will have packet drops. You can assume you will have packet drops because it's a very unsecured channel. Uh, and if you're going on the, over the internet, well, there's a lot of things that you cannot control. And you also need to think about which messages are are critical. If you're controlling the cutoff of a synthesizer with a knob, maybe it's not the end of the world if some messages in between get dropped. Uh, but if you're sending keyboard data, you definitely don't want the note, the corresponding note off to a note on to be lost or to be reordered even so it comes before the note on. Um, yes. Something that you can also uh, run into is, is feedback loops from, from a GUI. If you have an audio processor that sends a notification to a UI that this parameter has changed, and then the UI itself sends a set parameter request, that could cause another notification. So it kind of goes, it loops around. You can even run into a situation if you have multiple UIs that change the same parameter at once, and they, then they keep fighting over which value is really the true value. Like one says, no, it should be two. And then you get, the other gets a notification that it's two. No, it should be three. And then it, it keeps sort of bouncing back and forth. And the, the common solution to this is that you make sure that UIs don't echo their states if they receive. They only echo if, if you were actually changing from that GUI. So if you receive a notification, UIs should update their internal state, they should update their graphical interfaces or graphical widgets, uh, but don't send a set request. Um, you might also think about complementary solutions like not echoing parameters that didn't actually change. So if you have a set parameter request, but the value is the same as the old one, you don't echo it. Um, so uh, we haven't actually said anything about where you should implement this. Um, and it, it kind of depends on the situation. Um, we saw earlier that there's a lot of DWs that already implement support for OSC and for MIDI, or sometimes there's other scripting protocols. Um, and that's really cool. I mean, that gives you the best integration if you can integrate it with the host. Uh, but we also saw that parameter APIs are very limited. You're limited to this list of normalized floating point values. Um, and if, if you want to do more complex editing, you might choose to implement remote control in a plugin itself and then bypassing the host. Uh, and this is fine to do, uh, but it also poses its own set of uh, problems and challenges, because now you have to make sure that changes coming from a remote UI needs to be synchronized to the host so that their states doesn't drift apart. And vice versa, if a host is automating a parameter, a plugin needs to make sure that a remote GUI that the host doesn't know about is, is also updated with the same, with the same values. Um, there could be collisions also. So you need to have some sort of idea or tactics for handling that. And finally, a note on, on bandwidth issue. Uh, if you have something like a view meter or something that responds to audio in real time, you don't want to be sending notifications for every buffer, and absolutely not for every sample, because there will be hundreds or thousands of notifications per second that you can starve a network channel with that. Um, so something like that, you should ideally limit it to 25, 30 hertz. Um, and if you have a UI which has a higher refresh rate that runs at 60 FPS or something, you can usually just uh, interpolate between values to get a smooth looking GUI. So let's, let's look at how OSC and gRPC together can, um, can fit all our needs and how they compare against each other. It, it's kind of a comparison, comparing simple messaging versus uh, remote procedure calls. Um, and if you look at latency, like latency is incredibly important to us. Um, OSC uses UDP by default, so it's, it's very fast, but also not very reliable. But you can also choose to use other transport layers for OSC. Um, gRPC uses HTTP2 by default, which could incur a bit of latency, um, but also gives you safer and more reliable um, a service. Um, 
So if you want to do something like just setting property state or getting state chances back, OSC is, is an ideal thing because it's stateless. You can just send messages. Or you can just receive messages. Um, however, if you want to do something that requires a complex architecture, controlling a full DW, um, gRPC is a really good choice because you can, you can create any kind of architecture you want, and you can send arbitrary complex data structures. Um, it's also a request response model. Uh, it's connection based, which gives you device discovery. You know that it's there because you connected. And also, if the device crashes or goes down, you will know that because the connection will be broken. Um, there is also a streaming service in gRPC that you can use and that we have used to build a kind of more publish subscribe model with push notifications. Um, yes. Um, and looking at end-user development, um, gRPC, on the other hand, might not be the best choice for end-user development because it's very complex. It requires a lot of programming knowledge. Um, and if you want to change something in the API, you need to stop. You need to recompile. And you could, it also creates very high coupling between. You, have, you need to tailor the specific API and interface to one, one plugin or one processor. Um, on the other hand, OSC is the, the complete opposite of all this. OSC gives you human-readable messages and messages that are easy to modify, or also low coupling between, between nodes so you can connect them at runtime. Uh, and OSC also has a huge ecosystem of like, audiovisual software, controlling software, that just, it just works together. So the implicit question here, should you choose simple messaging or remote procedure call? Um, Yes, you should have both of them, because they have different strengths and weaknesses. And if you combine them, you can get the best of both worlds. Um, now onto a quick look on the tools that we at Elk Audio have and we, you can provide. Uh, we have Sushi. Sushi is the main audio engine in uh, Elk Audio OS. Uh, it's a full-featured DAW. It hosts plugins in LV2, VST2, and VST3 formats. Uh, you can do quite complex audio and MIDI routing. This, uh, it's open source, and it's headless, meaning it doesn't have a GUI. It's a command line application. Uh, but you can control it over, over MIDI, you can control it over OSC, and it has a gRPC API where you can control uh, all, all aspects of it. Uh, if you do a quick look on what the gRPC interface for Sushi looks like, uh, it's divided into different controllers that control different things. This is an excerpt from the audiograph controller. Uh, and you have functions like create a track. You have to get all the processors of a track, which gives you a list of all the processors. Um, and this is protobuf, so this will be compiled into whatever programming language you, you choose to use. If you use C++, this will be C++ classes. And if you use Python, it will be Python objects, objects and so on. Um, we also did write a GUI for Sushi. Uh, it's a little example GUI that we wrote in Python using Qt. Um, it's about 500 lines of code, so it's not very big, but it can still control almost all aspects of, of Sushi. Uh, you can add the remote tracks, start and stop, set tempo, things like that. Uh, you can also control all the parameters of all the plugins hosted. Um, it doesn't use Sushi directly. It uses the ElkPy library, which is a little tiny wrapper library that we did around the gRPC interface of, of Sushi to give it. So if you have never worked with gRPC before and you find it a little cumbersome or verbose, you can use the ElkPy to make it even simpler. Uh, we also have a corresponding library for C++ called ElkCPP, which does the same thing. Uh, finally, we have we built an example plugin. Uh, to illustrate how you can do remote control in an audio plugin and in parallel to the host. So it's a Juice plugin that implements uh, OSC control on its own. It has an OSC server where you can set the parameter values over OSC. And if you do, it will also inform the host that this parameter has changed. And vice versa, if the host changes parameter, it will be echo over OSC just from the plugin. So it's a demonstration of, of how to do this. Uh, and all these examples are available on the Elk AudioOS uh, GitHub. 
So to, to wrap this up, this is what we've covered. Uh, we've gone through the context for headless audio, some common patterns in distributed systems, what challenges you will run into and how to get around those, some of the tools and examples that we at Elk Audio provide, and our concrete choices being OSC and gRPC and our motivations for that. And we will wrap this up with a demonstration. So I give the stage to Elias, and he will show you. First example, the gRPC API. We have here a very simple example, not many lines of code. First things first, I'm starting Sushi. There you go, it's running with an empty configuration. It's not broken. And what we're doing here is we're adding three plugins. First, a step sequencer, which happens to be an internal plugin. And then we're using just the simple MDA plugins that are part of the BST3 SDK to keep things easy when you clone and run, which is the MDA GX10 and the uh, dub delay effect on top of that. So what does the code do? Always using Elk Pi, not gRPC directly, so that it's less verbose. First, we subscribe to processor changes, which is an example of publish subscribe. Then we fetch the ID of the track that has the name that we already know it has, the main one. You get the ID, and you need it for the next invocation, which is asynchronous, and it loads the three plugins in sequence onto that track. So we're waiting then for, not here it ends, and it waits for a notification to set the parameters when all three processors are ready. As soon as it's gotten those three notifications, it sets the parameters. So it sets some parameters on the synth, and it sets the notes that the step sequencer is going to be playing. So running this. You will hear this tune I've never heard before in my life. I'm sure you've never heard it either. I, I don't know where it came from. Uh, and with it running, I'm going to start the example GUI, which I think is very nicely done. Good work to the others who did it. You see the step sequencer updating from the notifications, and you see the very simple control panel for the MDA plugin, where you can pick the parameter everyone would have picked, the frequency of the filter. And as you see, it works. Anyway, so that's the GRPC bit. Not much more to say. Not a bad thing. I like it. It works, so no problems here. I'm going to show you a nice little end user development example as well. This time, over OSC. So we have here a program that I haven't written. It's called Synesthesia. And I chose it because it's not the most advanced or complex visuals program out there, but it's the one that will be the go-to application where just a small band or a DJ says, OK, I want some visuals. Nothing fancy. I don't have a PhD in audiovisual technology like, like some others. I just want to run something without reading the manual. And it supports OSC. Really nice program. Uh, here we have our example GUI. And here we have two, which is an application which is a bit like a DAW, but for OSC. Uh, I'm using it as an example of controls for OSC. So what's going on here? I haven't done much setup in two. I'm sending OSC messages by dragging this slider, and you see they're received in two, and they're reflected. Two doesn't really know much about the Elk Juice example. It just knows that it sends messages in a particular UDP port, and it listens to them in another UDP port. And here, you see the messages coming. You can read what they are. OK, it's the cutoff and resonance. Meanwhile, I now, for the first time, dragged the room size slider, and then the damping for the reverb algorithm. And you get controls up there appearing because two got these messages and they put them up on the screen. Last thing uh, I'm going to show you is 
Say that you want to map the controls of the example, very simple example here, not really real world, to the visuals. So you say, okay, I want the cutoff to go to the Cinecedia's beam width, set up before just simply like you just saw, and resonance to separation. Let's see if that's nice. So I'm dragging these, and you're seeing they're being controlled, adding interest to the visual, so they're not just audio reactive. There's a bit more happening. There's a, a bit more of a connection between the music and the visuals. And what's nice here is then you can, during the performance, if you're more than one person, also gradually change these connections. So you have a narrative in the connections during a performance. Always nice. So live and user development.